of this hour. Dear God, we come into your divine presence thanking you for life and for health. Thanking you most of all for Jesus who died on that cross to save us from utter despair. To save us from the slavery of sin. To save us from the power of Satan. And to deliver us into his everlasting kingdom. Bless us, Lord, as we look into your word, touch heart, prick consciences, and save us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. It's good to be here. Good evening, everybody. On Friday, I missed my flight here. Oh, let me put it this way, the flight was canceled. And um, they told me on Saturday, no flight. Yes, better now, thank you. Sounds rich. <laughs> um, so when the flight was canceled because I was told that there was a, a, a thunderstorm over here, uh, they make us go through security and they told us the flight is, they told us, well, the flight is postponed for 9.20 and then for 10 and then for 11.30 and then for 12.30, they took us out then they brought us back through security again, and then they took us out again. <laughs> there was no flight on, on, on Saturday, and uh, Sunday is the day that we can get here. I want to thank God for a safe passage to Canada. I want to thank also Pastor Ledford for invitation here, and also the church for inviting me here. And um, I want to thank also Pastor uh, uh, Elder Arthur's for his accommodation and for taking me safely over. I pray that as we study the word of God during these two weeks, that many souls will be blessed, our hearts and our faith would be enriched and God's kingdom would be enlarged. Let me see, how many guests do we have? Just wave your hands, guests. Just wave your hands wherever you are. You are a guest with us tonight, just wave your hands. Don't be afraid, just wave your hands. Welcome. We want to thank you for coming, and we pray that the Lord will bless you in a special way tonight. I also want to let you know that um, I have written a few books, and uh, I'm just going to introduce three of them to you. Um, this one is Understanding the Mind of Offshoots. In essence, 
It is talking about the tricks that offshoots use to get you out of the church. I have another one I'm reading. I'm going to leave this one last. This one talks about divine justice. How fair is God in dealing with sinners and saints? And the last one is entitled, now some of you are from the Caribbean, so I'm sure that you would understand that term. It is actually a Patwa term. I'm from St. Lucia, so I understand Patwa. How many St. Lucians here? Uh, we got a few. All of you speak Patwa? All right, that one says to bull or not to bull. I uh, know, you will understand that term. Now, funny, as I went through the Caribbean, what I discover is this. <laughs> That not only St. Lucians understand it, Trini understand it, Vinci understand it, Bajans understand it. In fact, right through the Caribbean, I went as far as Tortola, and I was surprised. They understand the term bull. Now, in Canada, you're supposed to understand that because it, it is worse off in, it, it worse off in Canada than, than in the Caribbean in terms of it has been pronounced a right. Isn't that right? It has been pronounced a right. The struggle of homosexuality in the Caribbean. This book deals with a number of issues, and it grew out of, um, on the internet, I was invited to, to write, and there were many challenges from homosexuals, and I had to respond to them as a Seventh-day Adventist minister. And I took them to task on some of these issues why the church has taken its position, and why the position the church has taken is not anti-love, nor it is anti-inclusion. You see, we have to focus on what is God's rights. <laughs> and so if you want a copy of these, you can see me after, and we'll talk some more. I have a limited set of them here, a limited set. Tonight, we'll be looking at the subject, Invasion from Outer Space. Invasion from Outer Space. Hmm. Okay, it doesn't seem to be working from here. So uh, what I would suggest that you do is change it from behind. Now, this subject is a very important subject, invasion from outer space. And when you hear invasion, I'm sure that you're thinking of something is happening from out, out of this world. Not in this world, but something, there's some kind of intervention into this world. What I would invite him to do is to change for me from the back. I don't know if the uh, battery is too weak or... or the signal is too weak on, on this.
Okay, what I would invite you to do is to go back to the slide that you showed a while ago and just progress in order. Sorry for that hold up. <laughs> we should be should get it in order in a while. Well, I saw it work last night. I don't know what happened tonight. I missed my plane. <laughs> I guess the devil wants to mix some things for us tonight. But nonetheless, the message will go forth. Now, while you're trying to set up certain things, probably I can just have a discussion with you so that you don't remain, well, I'm waiting for too long. Um, this particular book entitled uh, Understanding the Mind of Offshoots, um, it has a, a, a lion and a, a, a cat. And the lion looks into the mirror and see, sorry, the cat looks in the mirror and sees a lion, meaning, it presents itself bigger than it's, it is. In like manner, this is the same thing about offshoots. Haven't you heard individuals say, we are the remnant of the remnant? Haven't you heard them, heard them say that we are the true Israel? In other words, they are more Adventist than you are Adventist. The attraction is to present themselves as superior. They are superior in doctrine. They are superior in life. I had friends who went into offshoots and guess what? A few days later, they're not with their wives. They're not in the church. They're in the world. It's almost like the, 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 um, the false doctrine has besieged them. There is also another doctrine that I, that I didn't mention that is running around also in, in Canada. The idea that the Seventh-day Sabbath, Saturday, is not the Sabbath. The Sabbath is on the 8th of the month, the 15th of the month, the 22nd of the month, and the 29th of the month. It's called the Lunar Sabbath Theory. Haven't you all heard of that? I heard it is running in certain parts of Canada. Yes. And interestingly, there is absolutely zero basis for that in Scripture. There is zero basis for it in Scripture. You know, in my church, I, I, I discovered there was a young guy who was writing and sending those things around in the churches and also in my, among my the brethren 
And I, I, I spoke to him, and then I wrote an article in response to the 100 pages that he had written. And I sent it to every member and to all the pastors in Boston and to the president. Well, he boiled down like Baji. In essence, what I did is to deflate him. And I say this to say, as a church, we have to respond to false doctrines firmly. Because many people are led astray, and it is easy to leave, but hard to come back. Not only to the church, but sometimes even to the Lord. That's how bad it is. And how many people waste years of their lives promoting false doctrine with the fervor of a true doctrine. Only wasting their time, their talent, their treasure. And getting frustrated. This book tells you the tricks that um, uh, uh, um, promoters of false doctrine use. This one is a good one because it's really, especially for Canada, with this issue of homosexuality in the church and some people fearing that possibly they will force pastors to marry homosexuals or force the church to accept them into the church as, as um, in office while they practice. The church has maintained a firm position on this, that the Bible says that it is sin. Uh, you cannot write sin. Sin is sin. And Ellen White says at the church, we got to stand for right, though the heavens may fall. In other words, consequences should not be the basis on which we change our beliefs. And let me point out another issue on this. We got to love people in spite of their sin. We got to love people in spite of their sin. There are many people who are struggling in church with all different kinds of sin. And we do say that the, the, the church is a hospital. Am I right? And we do know the text in, in, in Romans that says, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, God's love knows no limits. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Can you imagine? While we're still waiting, can you imagine your son or your daughter comes to you and say, Mommy, Daddy, you know, all my life I've been attracted to boys rather than girls, or to girls rather than boys. And I've prayed about it, I've fasted about it, I've kept it away from you, but it still troubles me. I don't know what to do, and prayer is not enough. Fasting is not enough. Going to church is not enough. Keeping the Sabbath is not enough. Returning tithes is not enough. I'm still being affected. What would you say to that child? You tell him a lie? You're not really experiencing it? These are real issues within the church that we have to face up to. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. Read this book. Well, we got a blank. Okay, we have it on one side. All right, we're going to preach from behind then. This world 
we live in is a bewildered world. It is confused. It is lost. It is disoriented. It is confused. It is unsure. It is almost like we do not know where we are going. We are like the dog that shoot off its destination label so it does not know where it came from and where it's going to. I said this world is perplexed. It is bewildered. We face what is called de deadly danger ahead. That is cosmocide. And when we say cosmocide, what we are talking about is this. Mass suicide. Mass suicide. We have the issue of the bomb we constantly hear of. Terrorism, racism, drug <coughs> trafficking and drug addiction, civil disobedience and commotion, uh, family and sex crisis, disaster, earthquakes, floods and hurricanes and dis diseases, excessive wealth, those people who are stinking rich, an abject poverty, people who live a, a, a homeless life, who live under the bridge, and global warming. I say deadly danger ahead. It is even predicted that global warming will lead to the place where even New York City will go underwater through a tsunami. Can you imagine people in the subway when that, if that may, would happen? What would happen? Millions of people would die. They have predicted deadly danger ahead. Deadly danger ahead. Well, we are stuck again. Deadly danger ahead. We have not only chewed our destination label, we have also missed the way. But the Bible lets us know that we can find the way and that way is in Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way. I am the way that leads you from this earth to heaven. I am the way that leads you from sin to holiness. I am the way that leads you uh, from being unchristian to being Christian. I am the way that leads you from evil to good. I am the way that leads you to the eternal presence of God. I am the way, Jesus says. The Bible has paralleled our time to the time of Noah. The conditions that were back there, the Bible has predicted it to be the same in our present time. And this will bring the world to an end. And notice we are talking about invasion from outer space. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 17, verse 26, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. So here we have a parallel. We are living in the time of the end. And the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in our present time. Just before Christ is about to appear, the conditions will be similar. Now, what are the similarities? And this is what we're going to be looking at. 
What are the similarities? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. What are the similarities? Well, hmm, it's running ahead. He's following you. Mm -hmm. When you change there, he's going to change at the back so you can read from it. Okay. So number one, Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 says, the profile of a doomed generation. Notice we're talking about invasion from outer space. Notice we are talking about as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be just before Christ is about to appear. The first thing the Bible emphasizes here is a population explosion. In the days of Noah, there was a population explosion. Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply, the word multiplication upon the face of the earth indicates that there was a population explosion in the days of Noah. Do we live in an age when we are approaching population explosion? Hmm? Well, the countless number of individuals on in this earth, the population of Canada is 36 million. Hmm? The world population is 7.5 billion. And I want to go to something else to let you see what is happening. A little clearer with the population explosion. In 1800, the population of this world was 1 billion. After 100 and 27 years, that takes us to 1927. It became what? Two billions. Then 33 years after 1927, we come to 1960, it became what? Three billion. Now I want you to note what's happening. The number of years to get another billion is reducing. Do you realize that? From, from 1 billion to 2 billion, it took 127 years. Then you come to the, 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 the third billion, it took how many? 33 years. You see, the number is going down and down. Then from, 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 from 1960 to 1974, which brings us to the fourth billion, what do we have? Only 14 years. So 127 to 33, now to 14. And then to get the fifth billion, what do you end up? 13 years. And to get the, the sixth billion, you have how many years? 12 years going down. And then <clears throat> we have, after 12 years, we go to 2011. We have 7 billion. And that's where we are. 7 billion. 0.5 billion people on this earth. Now what is predicted? Well, they have predicted uh, that 14 years from now, which takes us to what? 2025, it would be 8 billion. It's kind of, the number of years is going back up. And eight, 18 years from 2025, you have 2043, you'd have 9 billion. And in 40 years, 2083, you'll have 10 billion. So it's going up. It's going up. It is predicted that there's a danger level. 200 years from now will take us to 150 billion. As a result, what will happen? Food supply, too many people and too little food. Isn't that something? Living space, people clawing on one another for standing space. <clears throat> so we are approaching a danger level and human beings do not have the solution for it. 
It may be why they are promoting homosexuality. So more couples you have, the less you don't have children. Female with female, that's a dead procreation, procreational end. Don't have children. Male with male, no children. It may be one of the reasons. The Bible says, but as it was in the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Men began to multiply upon the face of the earth. So first we see a population explosion as a danger that we face. And as a result of a population explosion, we're going to have starvation. Large scale starvation. Too many people and too little food. Too little space and too many people. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Not only is there a population explosion, there, is, there was also a social crisis. There was also a social crisis. The Bible says the sons of God saw that the daughters of men that they were fair. And we live in an age what you call the cult of beauty and the cult of youth. And they took them wives of all which they chose. They took them wives of all which they chose. And the Bible went on to say, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Did you get that? If you read the text, it's like there's nothing wrong. They married wives and they're supposed to marry, yeah. They were given in marriage. That is the woman given in marriage. These are normal activities. Until the day. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Well, that social crisis that we face today is evident. We have issues of nudity, that's nakedness, rampant in our society. The family, the home, and even sex is affected. Nudity, incest, where a man sleeps with his daughter, or even a mother sleeps with her, with her son. Hmm? Incest. And it is not only out there in the world, it has also found itself in the church. And sometimes, uh, uh, when you have a situation where the wife is not working, uh, she fear to report it because he will go to jail and they have no source of income. So the evil continues in the name of money. The love of money is the root of all evil. We are free love. Pornography that has made itself uh, so free. All you got to do is go on the computer. Pornography, teenage pregnancy, homosexuality, orgies, sex parties, wife swapping, where a man brings his wife to be used by another man. Hmm? Obscenity, you look on, on, on the TV, what do you find? There is not a show without some kind of profanity. There is not a joke without some kind of obscene language. We live in a world where uh, that is affected by the immorality bug. We live in a world in which uh, the, uh, we can call it an anything goes generation. We live in a world in which it is always sex o'clock. A social crisis that is destroying the very fabric of our society. We live in a world where men fail to be there with the woman that they gave child to. Single parenthood. 
especially among black men. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. One, population explosion. Two, a social crisis. Not only this, the Bible goes on to say, great wickedness is another profile of this doomed generation. And God saw that the wickedness was great in the earth. And every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In other words, the Bible is saying, God looked upon the earth during the days of Noah and he saw that men were sick to their souls. Deep down in their very core, they desire and they did evil no matter what. They were heedless of the word of God, the will of God, the way of God. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Only evil continually. Great wickedness. Drug, gang, killings, race, riots, mm? school shootings, mass murders, Mass suicide. We have issues in the Middle East where you have ISIS with all the cruelties of cutting people's heads off. Terrorism of ISIS, Al Qaeda, or Boko Haram in Africa, and the lone wolf terrorism that we talk about in America. Police brutality, especially of black men. Great wickedness in the earth. As it was in the days of Noah, the Bible says, so shall it also be. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every thought of his imagination was only evil continually. The Bible also says in Genesis chapter 6 verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God. And it's talking about moral corruption, environmental corruption also, corruption of the air, of the water, and of the food that we eat. Even vegetarian lifestyle doesn't free you from the corruption in this world. Americans throw away annually 30 million tons of paper. Four billion tons of plastic. That's every year. 48 billion uh, cans. 38 billion bottles. Hmm? The earth was filled with violence, also the Bible says. Apart from the environmental pollution, the earth was filled with violence. And note well, in America, every two minutes, Another American is sexually assaulted. There is one death by suicide in the U.S. every 13 minutes, according to the CDC. One person commits suicide about every 40 seconds. One person is murdered every 60 seconds. And one person dies in armed conflict every 100 seconds according to the World Health Organization. Ain't we living in a world that is doomed? Profiled of a doomed generation? The violence is reaching up to heaven as it reached up to heaven during the days of Noah? The Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the, into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Noah, it will be in the days of the Son of Man. There is a clear parallel. There is a clear analogy of materialism, secularism, and also revelry 
partying and dancing and being heedless about God as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in our present age. Men do not care about God. They even think those who go to church and those who care about God, they are insane. The Bible says, but the same day as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in our present time. But it says, but the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In other words, everything will continue calm and easy, nice. There's nothing going on. Nothing is wrong. The flood came in when men predicted they, they had never seen any flood. No one has seen the coming of Christ. So how many believe he will ever come? Some do not. They do not have the faith. But as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in our present time. And note well. God says, my spirit will not always strive with man. In essence, through that profile that we have gone through that is parallel to our present age, God says, my spirit will not always strive with man. For that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be 120. God gave them 120 years. They saw the ark being built. They saw animals, unintelligent beings, walking into the ark two by two. They still did not believe. Noah preached for 120 years, a preacher of righteousness. They still did not heed. They believed they were okay and they were good enough. They even believed that there was no God during that time. And Noah himself was an insane man. To be building an ark for rain that had never fallen upon the face of the earth? For water in that quantity they have never seen before? Noah must be crazy. The scientists declare that what he was teaching is false. And they believe the scientists. God says... My spirit will not always strive with men. Those who hear the message of God but continue to resist over and over again, God is saying to you personally, my spirit will not always strive with man. My spirit will not always strive with woman. There is a point beyond which I can go no farther. Hither too shall thou come, Job says, but no farther. And here shall thy proud waves be stayed. There is a point at which God has to step in. He gave them 120 years probation. What is probation? Probation is a time of mercy that God has given sinners to return to him. Did you hear me? Probation is a time of grace. And every one of us in our lives, we do have a time of grace. And that ends in three ways. One, a death. Two, if we have committed blasphemy. And three, at the end of Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. The first one, a death. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27, As it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. Essentially, what the text is letting us know Death is the end. And it's the end in the sense there is no second probation. Your decision for Christ will not be done after you are dead. The dead is dead. The dead knows not anything. The dead is not living in hell or in heaven. The dead is dead. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. How you die, you stay. If you die unsaved, you remain unsaved. 
If you die with the idea that you will serve God sometime in the future, you still remain unsaved. To decide, not to decide, you have already decided. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. And it says, it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. Therefore, at death, your probation closes. You have no second chance. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. No wonder Jesus says, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Come now, not tomorrow. Like Pastor Warren said last night from his quotation from Martin Luther, the right time to do right is right now. The time to do right is always right. The time is now, not tomorrow. Because we have no control of the future. You may step out of this building and drop dead. You may go to bed tonight and never wake up. It is appointed unto man once to die and after this, the judgment. So number one way you can end your probation, the time of mercy that God has given you is by death. And you have no control over your death. Mm. The second way, the second way is Mark chapter 3 verse 28 says, Blasphemy. Verily, verily, I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men. And blasphemy, uh, whatever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Spirit has never forgiveness but is in danger of eternal judgment. Did you get that? So you can close your probation. Your probation closes at, at death. In other words, there's no second chance. In life, you make a decision for Jesus. Not after you die. Now is the accepted time. But another, you can be alive and still close your probation. Hello. You can be alive and still close your probation. What this means, how many people come to crusades over and over again? How many people hear the word of God over and over again? They sit, they listen, they understand what God requires of them, but they would not do it. They keep procrastinating. They keep postponing decision for Jesus sometime later. And to, 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 to one surprise, these are usually people who, when they were six, they resist. When they were 16, they resist. 26, 36, 46, 56, 66, 76, and now they're 86, they're still resisting. They still have time. When they have the strength of youth to do work for God, they would not do it. It's like a, a young child. It's like a young child who goes to a stall with apples and he hides and he pulls the apple and he runs very far away and he eats the apple. He doesn't pay for it. Next time he goes to the stall, he takes the apple. But the first time when he went, he went running and trembling, afraid, sweating. And he goes and eats it. And then the second time he comes back, takes it, and probably run uh, uh, not very far. But there's less trepidation in him, less fear, less guilt. And he goes back and he takes it again. The guilt reduces, the fear reduces. Next time he might take it and go just around the corner and eat it. Because he hoped to get another one again. He takes it and probably he might stand right by the stall and eat it. In essence, the more you resist the Lord, the more darkness is coming into your soul. And the more difficult it is for you to resist Satan, the more control he gets of your life, 
and the more likelihood that you will never give your life to Christ. So the, the older you grow, you think is the wiser you're getting, is the more foolish you are. And the devil knows that he has you in the palm of his hand. So you get a place where you become very resistant to the spirit's pleading. The still small voice, you cannot hear it. Because you drown, you drown that voice with all the noise in your life. And guess what? There comes a point where God cannot do anything about you. Satan reached that place. God, Satan is unredeemable. God cannot save him. He has committed the unpardonable sin. And the unpardonable sin is not a particular sin that you, you hope to confess. No. It is, it is more the unpardonable sin or the sin that God cannot forgive is more the sin that you will not repent of. It is the sin in which you continue to resist God as a matter of course. And so you reach the place where God cannot do anything for you. And so he has to leave you alone in your sin, to die in your sin without God and without hope. And so the next time you will come up when you die is in the second resurrection for the second death. I say people close their probation, one, by death. There's no second chance. People close their probation. There are people who are living, who are living dead. In essence, there's no salvation for them because they have resisted God for so long they don't want to hear anything about God, anything about gospel. They will not repent of their sins. They will hear the gospel. It will go from one ear to the other. It does not make sense. It does not matter to them. They want to have nothing to do about God. And even those who pretend that they want to do, they want to have something to do with God, they yet they will not give their life to Christ because they believe they are okay. The devil has successfully deceived and entrapped them. And the last way, well, the Bible also talks about that blasphemy. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that you should even pray for it. When you have reached that stage, there's nothing God can do for you. So people who think they are outsmarting the church, outsmarting the pastor, outsmarting church people, and they don't want to give their lives to Christ, well, God can't do anything about it. What you sow, what you reap. And God is not a dictator. He will not force you to serve him. So if you're living with a man you're not married to, and you're living all the days of your life, and you keep resisting, knowing what God has called you to do, God cannot do anything about it. God will not save us in sin. He saves us from sin. The time is coming. That is the third way probation will close. When Jesus is no more the intercessor, when we pray to him, Christ stands between God the Father and us. He takes our sins, he forgives us of our sins. He is our high priest in heaven, in the heavenly sanctuary. The time is coming when he will no more be our high priest. He will remove his priestly garment and put on his kingly garment and come riding down the sky in flaming fire, the invasion from outer space. At that point, when the, in the judgment comes to an end in heaven, because now God is involved in a judgment, he says, he that believeth shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. The time is coming when Christ will no more be the intercessor between God and man to answer our prayer and to forgive us. And when he reaches that place, he removes his priestly garment and put on his kingly garment. Revelation 22 verse 11 says, he will pronounce that divine fiat, which says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. Uh, 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 behold, I come quickly. Not well. 
immediately after men and women are frozen in their spiritual condition, the Bible says, behold, I come quickly. Invasion from outer space. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Behold, I come quickly. Where are you tonight? Is this your last night on earth? Where are you tonight? Are you resisting the Holy Spirit to the point where he can do nothing for you to save you? Where are you tonight? When God calls your name in the judgment, and when that judgment comes to an end, and he pronounced that divine fiat, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and men and women are frozen in their spiritual condition, what? Will it be for you? God's patience is not without end. Did you get that? God's patience is not without end. The Bible says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The Bible did not say that there will be universal salvation. The Bible does not say that everybody will accept the, the, the Bible says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preaching to all the world, or all the world for a witness unto all nations. It is a witness for or against. For those who accept, it's a witness for them. For those who do not accept, it's a witness against them. For witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Then shall the end come. And so the Bible tells us, we live in a world where men are fearing. They are fearing for all the things that we spoke about that parallel the days of Noah. Men's heart failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. There is the fear of pollution. There's the fear of overpopulation. There's the fear of drugs. There's the fear of crumbling moral standards. There's the fear of violence. There's the fear of war. There's the fear of destruction. I say, men's heart is filling them for fear. The story is told about a hunter who went into the woods and he was hunting animals for food. And he found himself trapped. He saw fire from a distance. Then he began running. He saw fire in front of him in the direction he was running. He ran the opposite direction. Still there is fire. He ran until he got himself to a little hut. And on that hut, he climbed. And when he looked around, he saw the fire was coming toward him. So he was being enclosed. He went up to the top, the very tip top, and he looked around, and the fire, wind was blowing, and the fire was rapidly coming in his direction. Immediately, he went on his phone, and he dialed for help. And as he dialed for help, a helicopter came and took him in the very nick of time. He was saved from being cremated alive. I want to let you know we have fires all around us and it is burning hot. But Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, the promise is, I will come again. To receive you unto myself, that where I am, there he may be also. Invasion from outer space. I will come again. I will come again. Invasion from outer space. The divine intervention to make a difference in this world. Where do you stand tonight? Jesus says, behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Behold, I come quickly. Amen. How many of you? How many of you are ready for Jesus to come? 
have you made your calling an election show? Are you ready for Jesus to come? Have you accepted his life? Have you accepted his will? Have you accepted his way? Are you looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of a great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify us a peculiar people zealous of good works. You know, back there, these individuals did not believe what Noah preached until the angel shut the door. What God has shut, no man can open. And these individuals began to knock and now they begin to say, Noah, we now believe in what you're saying. But it was too late. Too late shall be your cry. Too late shall be your cry. But I want to say tonight, the way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. Shed for me way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to You want to say, Jesus, I want to give my life to you. You want to say this? Just stand to your feet wherever you are. I want to give my life to you. You want to demonstrate the giving of your life to Jesus and the preparation of your life for his second advent, for that invasion from outer space. Wherever you are, I invite you to come forward for prayer. Wherever you are, I invite you to come forward. You want to demonstrate. You want to say, Jesus, I want to give myself to you. I want to accept you and re-accept you as my Savior. You want to say this wherever you are, I invite you to step forward. Step forward quickly for prayer. Step forward quickly wherever you are. You want to give your life to Christ. You want to recommit yourself to him. I invite all of you to come forward for prayer. As she continues. First, the church members, I invite you to step forward to recommit yourself to God. Wherever you are, I invite you to step forward.
bless you. There are some of you who have not given your life to Christ, but you want to say, Lord, give me the strength to take a stand for you. We are not calling you to become part of a church at this time. We are not calling you to be baptized at this time, but we are calling you forward to be bold, to be bloody, to be resolute, to be firm for the Lord who created you and brought you into this world. I invite you to step forward wherever you are quickly. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Heads bowed, eyes closed. As she sings softly. Dear God, you have seen the decision of your people. We pray for your blessing of peace and forgiveness upon them. We pray for the power of your Holy Spirit to deliver them from the power of Satan. We pray, Lord, that your spirit may be felt in their lives to empower them over sin. We pray, Lord, for our guests who have stepped forward, asking you to be their savior, asking you to be the forgiver of their sins, asking you for the, for the empowerment so that they can live a life that is pleasing in your sight. I pray, Lord, tonight that you may touch lives, touch hearts, touch children, touch husbands, touch wives. I pray, Lord, that you may touch consciences, prick consciences. Let them know that you are mighty to save. Let them know that Satan has the upper hand when we try to fight him alone, but with you, we have the almighty hand. Give us deliverance tonight. Those who are sick, heal them. Those who are spiritually sick, heal them. Those who are socially sick, Help them, Lord. Touch lives. Make them true Christians inside heart. Those who have not given their lives to you, transform them through your grace and by your power. Let them know, Lord, that you are mighty to save. Let them know that you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let them know, Lord, that the most important thing in life is not survival, but salvation. Let them know. That soon and very soon you will burst the clouds of heaven and only those who have, who have uh, placed you first and seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness shall be saved. We know, Lord, that Satan will put things in their way. Give them excuses why they should not give their lives to you. We pray, Lord, that them, you may be the answer to all their problems. You may be the solution. You may be the remedy. Give them a strong faith. Give them a faith that can move the mountains of difficulties and take a stand for you. May we leave this place delivered, freed in Jesus. For if Jesus has set us free, we are free indeed. God bless you. Yeah.